ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Chip Seal Equipment and Calibration Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be given at that time. You can also submit questions through the chat box. And we will get to those as time permits. If you should require assistance during the call, press star, then zero. This conference is being recorded. I would like to turn the conference over to your host, Jason Meads. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jason Dietz, and I'm with the Federal Highway Resource Center and partnering today with the Pavement Preservation and Recycling Alliance, PPRA, on a series of these pavement preservation webinars focusing on pavement preservation, keeping our good roads good. Today's webinar will focus on chip seal equipment and calibration. You will see a number of polls up on your screen. We ask you to take a moment to answer those as we'll close in on them in just a few minutes. We also encourage questions during the webinar and ask you to please take the time to respond to the evaluations at the end. All the attendees are on mute, but you can submit any questions through the chat function on your screen, and we will answer them if time permits, as mentioned. We'll be offering PDHs for today's webinar on, upon request. So please let us know after the webinar if you would like to receive uh, PDHs. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Brian Horner. Brian Horner is employed with Etnire Corporation, located in Oregon, mm -hmm. Illinois, for the past 36 years. He is currently the North American Sales Manager, responsible for sales, dealer management, and customer training for all Etnire products. Brian, on behalf of PPRA and FHWA, I want to thank you for your time today, for your presentation, and I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. All right, no problem. Welcome, everybody. And you're going to bring up the presentation, correct? There it is. All right, everybody. Um, as Jason stated, my name is Brian Horner. I'm with Etnire. Um, I've done quite a few of these presentations in the past, and I like to make them, even though it's not in front of a live crowd where we can talk back and forth, um, I like to make it as interactive as we possibly can. Um, so if you do have questions, please throw them out in the chat boxes. Um, if not, we'll, we'll pick up some at the end and hopefully get some good questions there. But the whole goal of my entire career working for a manufacturer of building chip seal style equipment is to promote the fact of doing good chip seals. Um, in most places, um, chip seals aren't the most popular treatments for preventative maintenance in the world. Um, general public doesn't seem to like them real well because of possible dust or chip loss, broken windshields, um, various reasons that the general public just wants hot mix asphalt and, and not pavement preservation treatment. So the whole goal is to do the best possible job that we can to put down good chip seals. So hopefully in this presentation we'll answer some of your questions um, so that you're able to um, get good chip seals in the future. So in today's presentation, um, we're going to talk mainly about distributors and chip spreaders, the two biggest pieces in the, in the puzzle of the pavement preservation with chip seal. And then, of course, rollers are important and, and brooms also, a little bit about brooming at the very end here. Um, but talking about distributors and chip spreaders and getting those lined out so that we get the, the job that we really want is the most important. If I figure out, there we go. Um, so let's talk a little bit about distributors. If I can figure out how to run my computer. Um, so the first poll question is, um, there, he just brought it up. What group best describes you? Are you an agency, industry, supplier, academia, or a testing lab? Just sort of gives us an idea of how many different people we have out there and 
um, who's actually listening today. So with distributors themselves, um, distributors have come a long ways over the years. Um, as it's been, I have been here forever, 36 plus years um, working with distributors. But um, really back in the 1800s is where distributors actually started. Um, Horse-drawn distributor tanks um, worked very well, actually. They're very similar to what we produce today. Um, except obviously we put them on a truck instead of pulling them behind horses. But the asphalt pump that is putting out the material was driven by a chain that hooked to the axle. So in theory, the faster the horses went, the more the pump turned, the slower the horses went, the, the slower the pump turned. Same thing we do today, but now we do it with computers and hydraulics. So over the years um, in the um, secession of distributors, we decided we needed some more torque when we put them on trucks, so we made rear engine distributors in those days, um, mainly a two-man operation. Then as time went along, we, we got into the, the 60s and 70s where we started to do is using hydrostat components to drive our asphalt pump and spray bar, so we had a little ground speed control, so the truck then would be tied to the the distributor portion, so the faster the truck went, the more the pump put out, and the slower the truck went, the less the pump put out. So that all transpired. Then we got into the 1990s, and that's where the world really changed in the distributors, um, because then we started utilizing computer controls. So now we were able to do lots of things. We were able to not only go wider in our spray patterns, we were able to control the spray bar and one foot controls and have the computer control the asphalt pump. So any change of spray bar or speed would then be taken through the computer to maintain that application rate. So the guts of every distributor, whether you're chip sealing, tacking, fog sealing, whatever you're doing are really the same. So we can do full width, we can do single lane. So really the only variances in distributors these days is the fact of how much spray bar do you want to put on it and what rates you want to shoot so we know what nozzles to put in it. But the whole goal of this presentation is how do I get the uniform application from one side of my shot to the other side of my shot or from one curb line to the other curb line um, in order to get a good chip seal and to hold that rock into place I need to have uniform application. So not only knowing about the equipment, but also we're not going to talk very much about it in this presentation, but um, knowing what materials that you're using, what, what type of binders or asphalts, emulsions, hot oils, cutbacks, what type of products we're actually putting through that distributor onto the road, road to make our chip seal. So we need to know stuff about the equipment but we also need to know stuff about the materials. So then just a, another old picture there of a two-man machine. So just a, a quick overview of a distributor. Um, the basic functions are we're going to fill it, we're going to heat it, we're going to circulate it and get it all going, everything warmed up. Then we're going to spray it in that metered application. That's what we're really going to talk about. How do we get there? How do we get what we want on the road? How do we maintain our truck to make sure we are getting consistent shot rates? At the end of the day, we're going to suck everything back out of the system. We're going to clean it out a little bit, and we're going to go home. So the application is what we really want to talk about. What application do we want on the road, and how do we get it? So this is one way to get a uniform application. Just dump a bunch out there and squeegee it around. Um, it would get the job done, but I would be afraid that we would be thin in some spots and thick in other spots, and then our rock won't stick where it's supposed to. There's the, the calculated eyeball, which also gets you there. But remember, the, the metering system itself consists of really four basic components. Somebody's going to give you a desired application rate. So I, I've seen in the poll question a lot of agencies here. So I'm assuming that you will come up with a spec for the given road 
that you will pinpoint a, a desired application. Then we have to determine what speed we actually want to drive, what width we actually want to spray, and with those three things, then the asphalt pump with the computers takes over to give us our output of our asphalt pump. One of the things I do want to make everybody aware of is chip seal is a work in progress. You know, it's sort of a painting in my, my mind. It's not the same all the way through. So I don't want anybody to get caught in the same trap of we've always used this application rate and this amount of rock, and that's what we do, and we're having some issues. Every road surface is a little different, so you really have to look at the road surface and determine what application rate of binder you want to put down for that particular road surface. If a road is really cry, cracked or dry, porous, we might have to up our shot rates. If it's a little bit um, flush in a little bit or it bleeds a little bit, uh, we need to lower that shot rate. So you really have to, to look at the roads before we can just determine a, a particular shot rate. So those are our four components, again, in just a different format. The truck speeds up, the pump's going to change. If I change my spray bar width, the pump's going to change. If I change my application rate while I'm spraying, my pump's going to change. So all four of those things work together consistently so that we can make sure that um, we're getting that uniform application. So then the calculated I was the guessing game. That was where somebody just started shooting oil and somebody stood along the road and said, yeah, you need more or you need less. Well, we really don't want to do that anymore. We want to let the computers on the machines do what they're supposed to um, so we have some baseline. So if we do have any failures in our chip seal, at least we'll know we got the uniform application. We don't want to guess anymore. And we're going to use gallons per square yard. That's how most distributors are set up. But if anybody happens to be using any um, of the metric system, every distributor is set up to be able, every computerized distributor, I should say, is set up to be able to easily change over to liters per square meter if that's what you would like. So the whole system is really simple. Um, it's basically a pump with a circulating system, and we're, we're creating a fan um, or a pressure coming out of a nozzle. So that's really the whole gist of the distributor itself is a pump, a circulating system, and a nozzle. So then we need some inputs. So for the computers to work on any distributor out there, um, you got to have an input for a ground speed. And when we get into the calibration part, we'll talk a little bit more about setting these. But we have to have not only a feet per minute for how fast we're, we're traveling that the computer needs to look at to be able to adjust our asphalt pump, but also the distance that we're traveling. So we've got to have distance and we have to have speed. Then we also have to have some sort of way to, to measure the volume coming out of our pump. So every distributor manufacturer uses the same technology. It, it's called volumetric metering. So basically, we know that every time an asphalt pump turns one rotation, we get X number of gallons out the bottom. So with that computer input, we're sensing that pump revolutions, and we're feeding that back into a formula that says, per these revolutions, we get X amount of gallons. So, so then in the old days, the chip seal was pretty simple, sprayed oil, and they shoveled the rock on by hand. But when we get into the chip spreader portion, hopefully you won't be doing any of that. So there's your two inputs. It's garbage in, garbage out into a computer. So if we don't have a good feet per minute or distance, and if we don't have a good gallon per minute reading, the computers cannot give you a good uniform application. So how do we get there? Well, we, we use old school ways of, of slide rules to determine what width we want to spray. Then we can use that to say, OK, at that width, I want this rate. And when you put those two together in this slide rule that we provide, it will tell you at a certain speed your pump should be turning a certain gallons per minute. Well, we're in the 21st century, so now we're going to use apps. So if anybody out there has not downloaded any of the apps, um, if you're familiar with Bearcat equipment or Etnire equipment as I am, um, we both have apps. You can go to the App Store or the Apple Store. Google Store, Play Store, I guess. Um, it's free of charge. 
simple um, type in Etni or type in Bearcat, type in Computator. Um, many of those keywords will bring you to that free app. And what that app basically does for us is, is several things. One is it allows us to put in the application rate that we want, what width we want to spray, and it will, we can actually put in what nozzle we have in our spray bar, which is very important, and it will tell us basically what speed range we should drive to maintain that current application rate. Because that's one of the misconceptions of a computerized distributor is it doesn't matter, right? I can drive as fast as I want or go as slow as I want, and I'll still get the right rate. Well, that's true to a certain extent. Um, if you have the wrong size nozzle in your spray bar, and my pump's trying to pump more product than can actually get out the nozzle, it, it physically can't get out it. So there is limitations to it. And of course, asphalt pumps are rated about 400 gallons a minute. So if I try to drive fast enough that my pump reaches its max output, then the correlation doesn't work there either. So the apps are very helpful for computing how much oil you may need for a particular job or how much rock you may need for a particular job. You can punch in your, your width, your rates, and all that stuff, and it will tell you what you need for volumes. So those apps are out there. Um, this is the pump rate side of it. So that allows us to put in the rate, the width. It will give us the recommended speed for those nozzles. We can do it in miles per hour, and we can do it for gallons or um, feet per minute, either one. So it's just a quick, easy way for me as, as a guy training people to um, be able to make sure the computers are doing what they're supposed to just by looking at the numbers and what shows on the display in the cab. Um, so download those apps and, and use them. They're, they are very helpful. So then with the computers these days, it's basically just a, a digital display taking that app, and the app is in the computer, so it's looking at those inputs for that ground speed sensor and that pump speed sensor how many feet of bar you have turned on and what your application rate is, and then it just uses that, that configuration to, to keep the output the way it should be. So then there's a spray bar. It's another one of the components of a distributor. And we're going to talk a little bit about spray bar setup and everything here in just a few moments, but remember that a spray bar does not affect the application rate. It has nothing to do with it. It is only there to spread the amount of oil we want on the ground out as wide as we want it and give it a uniform application. You could take the spray bar off of any distributor truck out there. You could put in three-tenths of a gallon per square yard in your computer, turn on your switch, and you would drive a certain distance and you would get the right amount of oil. The only thing, it would just be out of a three-inch hole or stream down the middle of the road. It would not be spread out uniformly. So that's what the spray bar does but it does not affect your application rate. So what we want out of that spray bar, though, to get that good uniform coverage so our rock sticks correctly, is what we call flat fans. We want, as this picture describes, those good even fans coming out of those nozzles so we're painting that road surface as even as we possibly can. So here's your spray bar setup. So chip seal is always done by every manufacturer um, in triple overlap fashion. So that basically means that every third nozzle is overlapping the other nozzle. They don't touch each other. They don't hit each other. Otherwise, they'd splatter and you'd have ridges in your oil. But by getting 12 inches from the nozzle to the ground, we're guaranteed that triple overlap because all manufacturers put their nozzles on four-inch centers. So... Um, that's what we really need in a spray bar setup. If our bar is too high, our fans will be wider at the bottom and we're not overlapping the way that we should. If our bar is too low, they won't, the, the fans narrow up and we won't be able to, we'll, we'll see ridges. We'll have heavy spots in the oil and light spots in the oil. So we really want to try to maintain that 12 inches as close as we can. And there's your flat fan. As you can see by the, the diagram on the right, those fans come out of the nozzles, but they don't touch each other. Um, so they're just painting the road as you go down. So then we offer lots of different nozzles. And it, a lot of people always used what rate, you know, the application in gallons per square yard that the nozzle was rated for is one way to look at it. 
but really we're looking at trying to pick a nozzle for not only the application rate we want, but for the speed that we want to drive. So there's always variations of, uh, you know, some of these nozzles on this chart are, they, they can get up to your three-tenths of a gallon or four-tenths of a gallon, but you may have to drive a, a ridiculously slow speed in order to achieve that. So we always want to pick a nozzle for the speed we want to drive. So then the nozzles themselves are, are very important. Um, in years past, we used a lot of hot products. Um, now we're using a lot of emulsions. Um, if you have any distributors that have the picture on the right, which is a coin slot nozzle, just a slit in it, emulsions don't like those very well because they tend to, to stick to the edges of that coin slot as they're coming out the hole, and you'll, you'll see an imperfection in your spray pattern, heavy edges and light in the middle. So years and years ago, every manufacturer come out with a multi-slot, a V-jet, a coin, or a, a football-shaped orifice, a cat's eye, lots of different names for it. But basically, it's a football-shaped orifice that allows more oil, more emulsion to be dumped out the middle, a little less on the edges, but it equals itself out. So if you have different style nozzles in your bar, um, you should change those out so that they're all the same. So the nozzles play a very important part. question I get asked a lot is, how often should I change my nozzles? And of course, I'm a salesman, so um, they're about 10 bucks a piece, so I change them you know, every other day would be good for our sales department. But in reality, um, some of the testing that we've done, millions of gallons, and I'm talking three, four, five, six million gallons probably can go through a nozzle because the products we're shooting are petroleum-based, the nozzle's brass, so there's not a lot of wear to it. So you can shoot a lot of gallons through a nozzle before you would ever have to change it because of wear. But the angle of the nozzle is very important. Remember we talked about the flat fans and we talked about the triple overlap. Well, in order to achieve that, your nozzles have to be at 30 degree angles. So um, to measure that angle, you can put the nozzle wrench that's provided with the distributor, um, or a standard 7 8 inch wrench. You, you put that nozzle in, and when the handle touches the next nozzle, as this picture indicates, then you're set at that 30 degrees. Now, it doesn't matter if the 30 degrees is slanted like this picture or if it's slanted the opposite way, as long as all the nozzles on your spray bar are actually slanted at 30 degrees um, consistently, you'll get your triple overlap. So here's how the the guts of the distributor take volume out of that pump. So we're counting revolutions, as I explained, and we're creating pressure out of the nozzle. So we want the right pressure in order to get the spray pattern that we want. It's just like a garden hose. So think of it that way. If you turn on your spigot at your house, your hydrant in your barn, you're going to get a volume of water. Well, in order to make that spray better, simply all we do is put a different tip in it. So if we need a, a better spray pattern at a slower speed, we'd put a smaller nozzle in it. If we're going really fast, we or a lot of oil, we might put a bigger nozzle in it. So we're actually taking the volume and adjusting the pressure by changing the size of the, the nozzle itself. So here's just an example of that. Um, if I'm running a consistent speed, my volume of oil is consistent. In this case, it's 50 gallons a minute, okay? So I am getting the correct amount of oil on the left as I am on the right, but it just doesn't spray the same. So in order to get that correct amount of oil to spray evenly, I need to change the, squeeze my garden hose, you know, change this nozzle down to a smaller nozzle. So I take that volume and I pressurize it more coming out that tip. The other flip side to this is the oil on the left is still the same as the oil on the right, but in order to increase my volume, I had to increase my speed. So by going faster, my pump turned faster, and then out of the same size nozzle, I got a better spray pattern. So you can do it one way or the other. You can change your speed or you can change your nozzle in order to get that uniform application. The other thing about nozzles that you don't think about, you just got a plug nozzle. Somebody says, oh, that's not a big deal. 
But when you're dealing with chip seal and triple overlap, it actually is, because where that plug nozzle is, we're only getting double amount of oil there. So now maybe I don't have enough oil to hold my rock into place. And any place that that distributor sprayed with that plug nozzle, I could start losing my rock in that section. So you always want to make sure all your nozzles are clear. The other thing is low pressure. And what we mean by there is our volume has dropped below what our nozzle can create pressure to. So then you start seeing your fans droop off, I call it, and you, you see ridges in your oil. So your triple overlap isn't perfect triple overlap anymore because my fans can't get to that 12-inch wide part and I'm get, not getting uniform coverage. So then nobody wants to change nozzles, right? The distributor's not the cleanest thing out there. It's going to get a little overspray on it, all of that stuff. Um, so I want to do chip seal today and I want to do um, fog seal tomorrow or I'm chip sealing a mainline road today and I'm able to drive pretty fast, but tomorrow I want to do a parking lot where I can go really slow. Well, by cheating the system, what we're basically doing is shutting off some of the nozzles on the spray bar because the computers do not know there's nozzles on the bar. They don't know there's valves on the bar. They don't know there's air cylinders on the bar. They don't even know the spray bar is actually there. The computers only see the switches in the cab that you select to turn on the feed of bar that you want. So it's looking for an electrical input. So by physically shutting off some of the valves on the spray bar, we've taken the same volume of oil and we're forcing it through less holes so our pressure increases. So this is usually used for people who are chip sealing today and they need to tack or fog seal tomorrow and they don't want to change their nozzles. We can actually cheat the system either by every other nozzle or in some places, we just can't go fast enough to get the volume out of that nozzle, so we'll go to one nozzle per foot. So it still gives us all one foot controls, but we're able to get that. Well, now we just threw away everything I told you. You're 12 inches from your ground to your nozzle. You're going to have to raise the bar a little bit, or you're going to have to turn the 30-degree angle of the nozzle a little more parallel to the bar, um, or you're going to leave bare spots. But it is a way to be able to basically lie to the distributor on what you want to spray. Here's just a picture of it. This guy was shooting tack this day. Um, so he had his spray bar raised up. He's using one nozzle per foot. But you can still see what we're getting is that perfect uniform application across that street. That's what we want. Now, in chip seal, I wouldn't recommend doing that because we go away from our triple overlap. But in tack coating, we don't care if it's triple or double or single as long as we get enough glue down there to hold that asphalt. Just another picture of it here. So now we've got another poll question. What component of the distributor does not affect the application rate? Is it the nozzle? Is it the radar? Is it the spray bar? Or is it the pump speed sensor? And the results are coming in. Well, I don't have to wait any longer. I must have did a good job of explaining it because it looks like most of you people say that the spray bar um, does not affect the application, and is that, that is absolutely correct. So then we've talked a little bit about bar setup, a little bit about the distributor, but everybody asks about calibration. You know, that's what the purpose of this whole um, webinar is about, is about calibration. But unfortunately, with distributors and chip spreaders, there is no magic little button that you can push that says calibrate me, and you push the button and everything's back the way it should be. Okay? So calibration takes a little bit of thought and a few components. But I guess the one thing is, how do we measure our calibration? Okay? Why should we check the distributor's calibration in the first place? I mean, we want to make sure that the computer is actually doing what it's supposed to, right? Um, we want to make sure we're putting right down the right amount of oil so we don't get any bleeding or flooding of our chips and, and we get um, people with asphalt on their tires and then we have to wash some cars. Um, we want to make sure we have enough material there to retain the chips so we, that we get a good chip seal. 
and we want to save some money because we don't want to put down too much um, because then we're just wasting money. So those are the reasons why we do it. But what are the ways we use to check it? Um, this is the part where it's difficult because I can see nobody's faces out there and uh, people are like, well, we never check our calibration or are you supposed to? But there's a lot of different ways to do it. The simplest way is to stick the tank, we call it. So every distributor comes with a measuring stick that's calibrated for that particular tank size. So that is, um, on an Etnire distributor, it's reverse calibrated. So you can take that stick, you can stick it in the manhole there and just touch the top of the oil and then read it where the manhole is. It will tell you how much volume of oil or how many gallons you have left in that tank. So that is one way to do it. On other model distributors or um, other brand of distributors, um, you would put that stick all the way into the oil till it touched the bottom of the tank and then read it where the, the line of the oil is. But they all come with measuring sticks. So that's a simple way to do that. So how you would use that is I would bring my distributor to a job. I would stick the tank so I knew exactly how many gallons are in that tank. I wouldn't go off of the tank gauge itself because those are float gauges, so they can get off from time to time. I would use the stick because we know that it's calibrated. So you measure the oil in the tank. You shoot a, a specific pre-measured distance and width. Use your app. It will tell you how many gallons you should shoot in that distance. Then you go back and you stick the tank again and verify that you shot the right amount of oil for that distance and that width. So that's one way to check it. Oops. Keep hitting the wrong button here. The other way is by weight. So we can weigh the distributor when it's full, do the same thing, measured distance, measured width, do the, the application rate chart, see how many gallons we should use in that distance, then reweigh the truck, and then just do the math to figure out if we shot the right amount of oil in that distance just by purely weight. The other way that's probably the most popular across the United States of, of checking the rate is the longitudinal rate test. So that is a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit messier. Um, it, it's probably as accurate of tests that you'll ever get. It's a bunch of pre-weighed pads that we spray over, and then we re-weigh those pads to determine how much oil is on each pad. Um, so that is a, a very popular way if we want to check calibration of that distributor. So here's just a picture of one that we did a longitudinal rate test with. Um, this was down at NCAT um, where we had to verify everything that we shot. Now somebody's going to have to go pick up those gooey, nasty pads and put them on a scale and weigh them and then tell us if we shot the right amount of oil. But it is an accurate test. So then those are three ways to check your calibration. So let's say we checked our calibration and we're actually off. So now what components are involved and what do we got to look for of how to get that unit back in calibration? And it's pretty simple. Distributors seem very complex um, these days, but um, they're, they're very simple machine. Remember I told you we had to have a, an asphalt output, okay? So is my speed sensor counting the right revolutions of that pump? There's various things to look at there. We're not going to get into all the detail here. Um, but that speed sensor is looking at a gear in that motor to tell us how fast that pump's turning. There's settings in the computer that over the years we've used different speed sensors that we got to look at. The tolerance between the gear and the sensor makes a difference, but it's one area to look at. If we're not in calibration, we need to check to make sure we're counting the, the correct number of revolutions of our pump. The other thing is the radar. Are we getting the right speed is one thing but are we getting the right distance? That's probably the most crucial, is the distance. Because if we take our distributor and we're supposed to go 300 feet, and we actually went 298 feet, that's actually a pretty big difference. You think two feet and 300 is not bad, but really when you start multiplying that up and then keep going for miles and miles at a time, all of a sudden that's a pretty big number that we're off, which means your shot rate is off accordingly. Um, so you really have to look at the radar. So it needs to be set at the right angle, the lens needs to be clean, all that stuff that we can tell you about how to check that. Um, 
Calibrating the radars are pretty simple. You don't ever have to shoot oil to do it. I would recommend that you calibrate it or double check your radar every season for sure. Um, because if that distance is incorrect, so will your shot rate. And then there's mechanical things. So every distributor manufacturer has to get the oil from the tank into the pump, and then we got to tell it where to go, right? We have to tell it to go to the spray bar and spray. We got to tell it to circulate back to the tank, or we got to tell it just to keep circulating in the bar and not spray. So there's mechanical valves that are involved in that. So if your valve, when every distributor, when you spray with it, is shutting off the return to the tank. So that way we know everything that comes through our pump is going to the ground. Well, if that valve doesn't turn all the way, some of the oil that we're counting the revolutions of, because we're counting that pump, so it, it says, hey, I'm turning this speed, but some of the oil that went through my pump went back into my tank, my shot rate's going to be inconsistent. It's going to be off, light, if you will. Um, so there are mechanical components that you have to look at. Then there's the, the simplest one and probably the biggest culprit of a distributor not shooting the correct application is the strainer. So every distributor has a strainer above the pump because we never know what oil's in there. We've actually found sunglasses, we've found cell phones, we've found screwdrivers, all sorts of stuff that get caught in that strainer that end up in your tank, but we don't want them to run through our pump, so we put a strainer there. Well, in today's world with emulsions and stuff like that, we tend to, especially polymerized emulsions, we'll get the polymer that's separated, um, maybe we'll get the oil and water starting to separate, and it plugs that strainer up. Well, the computer doesn't know that. Um, it's counting the revolutions of the pump, which are below the strainer. So it's saying you're shooting the right amount of oil, but the oil physically isn't getting to the pump, which means our shot rate is then light again. So I, I will tell you that probably eight, maybe nine out of every ten phone calls I get in the course of the summer where somebody says, my pump is not spraying the right amount of oil, once they clean the strainer, it sprays good again. So we got to keep those strainers clean. If you pull your strainer out and it looks like this, um, you're not shooting the right amount of oil. The other thing, if there's any distributor operators in the group today, um, you will also notice that if your strainer is plugged up, it won't allow you to suck back the spray bar at the end of the day. can't create enough vacuum in the system. So if you have trouble sucking everything back at the end of the day, it's another good reason to check your strainer. So then what happens? I got my strainer, it's all plugged up, you know, it looks like this, nothing's going through it the way that it should. How do I clean it? Basically, you got to burn it off. Um, that asphalt's hard, it's hot, you're going to burn it off, you're going to clean it up, you're going to hit it with a wire brush a little bit, and you are going to um, get all those holes unplugged, put it back in, and, and the way you go. So, big thing to do is check it. You can check your strainer without pulling it. If you shine a flashlight down your fill pipe, um, you can see that strainer, so that way you can look at it without ever having to pull it. So, but check your strainer often. We make different strainers. Um, won't get into that, but if you're using a lot of trackless tacks, if you're paving and that, we can get you a strainer that will work better for that. If you're shooting a lot of polymerized asphalt or a lot of hot oils that are polymerized, um, we might go with a little bit bigger hole in the strainer to let some of that stuff pass through a little bit. But we never want too big a hole in our strainer that actually we don't want a hole that's bigger than our nozzle because then our nozzles become our strainer. So we're trying to protect the pump, but we're really trying to make sure we don't keep plugging nozzles. So then talking about calibration, your nozzle is your part of your calibration also. Do I have the right nozzle for the right application for the right speed? Because if I am trying to go too fast and my nozzle hole isn't large enough, I physically can't get the oil through it. So when I walk up to a distributor truck and it's just dripping with overspray, it's dirty, it's nasty, nine times out of ten I'll guarantee you that the operator is driving faster than the oil can go through the nozzle. So we need to slow him down or we need to go to a bigger size nozzle. So we just want to make sure that nozzles are a really important part of calibration. So things to remember on calibration. 
Is my nozzle size correct for the speed that I want? Is my four-way valve or my mechanical valve that's telling the oil where to go in time so it's turning how it's supposed to? Is my radar set correctly so I'm counting the correct distance? Is my strainer clean? Are my hydraulics okay? Not many problems with hydraulics. Um, I will mention that you would like to run your distributor trucks at below 1,800 RPM. Hydraulics don't work real well when you get up into 2,000, 2,200 RPM. And is my pump sensor set correctly? Um, those are just the things to remember when you're thinking about what could make my distributor truck be out of calibration. So poll question number three, what is the correct angle for the nozzles? So on your spray bar, you got 90 degrees, you got 30 degrees, should they be parallel to the bar, or doesn't it really matter? Well, look at that, 100%. Everybody is paying attention today. Thank you, everybody. Um, 30 degrees is the correct answer. Um, in order to get triple overlap, we have to have 30 degree angle on all of our nozzles. So operation books are available out there for distributors. Um, we'll talk about different links at the end, but there's videos on YouTube, there's videos on Etnar's website, all sorts of stuff to not only help you with calibration, but make sure you know how to run that piece of equipment safely. So with that being said, um, we'll pick up some questions at the end. I don't see anything in the chat box that I, I'm missing here. Um, we're going to talk about chip spreaders. They're actually a lot simpler. We covered the heavy stuff in the distributors already. So chip spreaders are a little simple, okay? We're just actually just putting some rock on top of our oil. We wouldn't even do that. I mean, a chip seal is a seal, right? So if we could seal the road and never put rock on top of it, we would do that. But in a chip seal, if you don't put some rock in there that stays in place, you don't have any traction, you don't have any wear, um, and it's going to get really sticky on your tires when you drive on it in the summertime. So we got to put some rock on there. So chip spreader really, all it's doing is applying that cover aggregate over our chip seal in a uniform application, and we want to do it uniformly so that we can save money on our aggregate. I mean, too much rock in a chip seal is detrimental to that chip seal. We want just the right amount of rock there and not too much. And then we want to increase our production. So using a chip spreader versus a bunch of shovels out of the back of a truck um, obviously is going to get you a lot more roads covered in the summertime than using the shovels. So chip spreaders come in various forms also. They come in fixed spreader boxes like this one that mainly everybody's doing one lane at a time. We make variable hopper chip spreaders that can do one lane at a time. Or the, the best way to chip seal is to be able to do the road in one pass. So if I was doing a full chip seal presentation, you know, you get rid of the chip seal seam in the center, where's your weakest point, your dump trucks are in the center of the road all the time where your weight's at. Um, chipping full width is, is a great way to chip seal. But what we really want is that uniform veil of rock, we, we, we call it. You know, when you look at that road, that rock is even all the way across the oil that we're putting it on um, so that we give it a chance to get into the oil and glue itself to that surface. But a chip spreader is really simple. Rock goes in the back, it comes out the front, goes up some conveyors, and the way we go. But there are some settings on that, in conveyors and augers and, and gates that we really need to talk about to make sure that we're getting the right amount of rock that we want. So the gate opening matters, the computer settings, what rock do we want? Do we want 20 pounds per square yard, 22 pounds per square yard? That will all vary depending on the size of aggregate you're using, depending on the weight of the aggregate you're using, depending on how much oil that you're actually putting on the road. Um, then we got to pick out conveyor speeds, auger speeds, and tire pressure. Those are things that we look at when we want to calibrate a chip spreader. up here. For some reason Jason and I cannot forward the next slide. Can I go back? I went back. Okay. It will not let me go forward. 
I got it for you, Brian. Okay. Flip me one more forward if you can. <laughs> Who's got control? Yours. All right, it's mine. Back to mine. Okay, so on a chip spreader hopper, you got a bunch of gates, okay? And those gates are individually being able to shut off one foot or six inches at a time so we can vary the width that we want because we don't want to put a bunch of rock in the ditch. We just want it on the oil that we're, we're covering. So those gates need to be adjusted. Um, that's an annual thing because gates are going to wear. You've got a bunch of aggregate going against metal, so they're going to wear a little bit. And there's wear plates that need to be adjusted on them. The air pressures need to be adjusted, the adjustment screws, all of that stuff. The key thing to remember, if you have a more modern chip spreader and you turn the key on on that chip spreader without starting the engine and you hear a mechanical bang and you shut the key off and you hear another mechanical bang, your gates are out of adjustment. You only should hear the air go psht, psht, is all you should hear. So if you hear that bang, it's time to adjust them. Um, if you don't adjust your gates, you can still spread rock. Um, you just may be limited on how fast you can spread it because the gates might not be able to open as far. And really what happens at the end is when you go to close them, um, they don't close all the way, and then you end up leaving piles in the road when you're sitting still. But then the conveyor belts are part of that too. The misconception of conveyor belts is the faster you run the belt, the more rock you get in your front hopper. That is not true. There is a fine line between running a belt too fast and too slow. If I slow the belt down, I actually carry a taller, wider band of rock on that belt than if I speed it up and carry a short, narrow band of rock. So the speed of the belt, really you just want the rock to come up the conveyor and dump into the front hopper. You don't want it blasting through the front hopper and wearing your hoods out. You're just running your belts way too fast and it's hard on your hydraulics. So the belt conveyor speeds on modern chip spreaders can be controlled right at the um, control station. You can set the percentage of speed that you want to run it. Older machines um, have some knobs on them where you can just turn the knob to adjust those, but you really need to adjust those. In a perfect world, if I took off with a loaded truck, I don't want my conveyors ever to shut off until I'm empty and I get a new truck. You don't want those hydraulics cycling off and on all the time. So we really want to run those belts at a consistent speed. Same way if you have a variable hopper chip spreader. You want to run your augers at a consistent speed. If you're running full width chipping, you're probably going to have them maxed out at 99% because the slowest part of the machine is the auger. So if I can't get rock clear to the ends of, of my hopper, I've got to slow down. So I'll, I'll run them fast. But if I'm using a variable hopper machine and I'm running one lane at a time, I need to slow those augers down. You don't want them to turn on and turn off, turn on and turn off. You want them to run and take that material out and stop for a second, run, and then stop. So adjusting the speed of the augers will help in your production and it will also help in the maintenance of the machine. Just another overview of the auger there. Augers will wear out, so that's a maintenance item. Um, so you can also, on modern chip spreaders, you can adjust the auger speeds right from the control station or on older machines, you would adjust them with, with the knobs themselves. So the first step in calibration is to make sure that the spreader hopper gates are correct. Okay? So let's just look at that for a second. So if you had, took the gate off the chip spreader, what I have circled here is the wear plate. So that wear plate is going to wear out. It's down against that spread roll, and rock's running by it all day long, so it's going to wear. So I want to set that wear plate just to the edge of the gate, not stuck out like this one. Because if I stick it out too far, you can see that that gate is curved. Well, as it opens up, you're pulling it through the rock. So if I have that whip sticking out that I have cir circled down there, it acts as a shovel, a wedge. And it can't get through the rock, so now maybe my gate doesn't open as quickly. Maybe my gate sticks and doesn't open at all because it can't physically force itself through that rock. So you really want to adjust that plate so it's about a sixteenth of an inch 
beyond the edge of that gate. Now I'm wearing on my wear plate and I'm not wearing on my gate itself, but I'm allowing that gate with that curved surface to pull up through that rock and my gates will open and close correctly. So that's the first thing that you do. But then we have adjustment screws, okay, on the sides. But the first thing then is you adjust the other wear plate. You, I use a putty knife. The red thing in the bottom of the picture is a putty knife handle. Stick that into the gate next to the spread roll and adjust that wear plate down against the putty knife, which gives you about a sixteenth of an inch gap. Okay? So two wear plates to adjust. Then you're going to have to adjust. The black part is the bus bar, we call it. The yellow part's the gate. You're going to have to adjust those screws down so that there's no gap in them. If you hear that bang, that's what you're hearing when you turn the key on is that yellow gate coming back up against that black arm. And that's telling it zero is not zero anymore. Closed is not closed. Open is not open. It doesn't know where it's at. The computer is, is lost for a minute. So you, you want to go through and you want to adjust all those. Then you have to actually go into the computer. You did all the manual adjustments, and this is all part of calibration. So you do the manual adjustments, and then you have to go in and, and do what we call the null and the scale. And what are you, you're saying, what's that mean? That's basically fancy words for telling the computer where closed and full open is. So now my computer knows my gate is closed at this point, and if I open it all the way up, it, it's open to a certain point, four inches on most hoppers. Why do we do that? Because we're controlling that gate not only with a switch to tell it to open, but it's automatically adjusting our application rate with the speed of our machine. It's tied to the joystick. So as I push my joystick forward, my gate will open more to maintain the application rate that I want. As I slow down, the gate will close also to try to maintain that application. If I don't go through this calibration of the gates and reset the null and the scale, the correlation between the gate, the computer, and the joystick is off and now you're not going to get uniform application. So here's the main operating screens. Very similar to a distributor. Um, somebody's going to tell it how many pounds per square yard that we want, what size rock that we want, and a, a particular speed that we want the machine to travel. So it just works very well that way. Um, just punch it in and go. But let's just use this as an example. We did all of our, our setting. So we, we set our gates, we set our null, we set our scale. Now we want to make sure what are we actually getting, and we want to fine tune it. So we got 20 pounds per square yard in here of 3 8 chips. So I actually am going to drop chips over a 3 foot by 3 foot tarp, so a 1 square yard tarp. I'm going to weigh it. I'm going to take that weight, and I'm going to compare it to, if you could read this, it says 21 and a half pounds. Well, I'm only asking for 20, so that means I'm off. So now I can go into the calibrate screen in the computer, and if you have a variable hopper, you have a right and a left, and say, how many pounds were I off? And in the left-hand side, you say, I need to go down two pounds, whatever the number is, and hit save. And now that told the computer to readjust so that it opens less to give me the right amount of rock. So it's a very simple way to calibrate. It takes 15 minutes to calibrate a chip spreader once you get all your gates set. Then you can do the left side, but that, that sets everything. So now my joystick, so my ground speed and everything is tied to my gates to give me the uniform application. The other thing in calibrating a chip spreader is tire pressure. Okay? You, there's no suspension on any chip spreader that's ever been built. So you have to soften the tires up to keep it from bouncing. If I'm making a washboard road, it means I'm bouncing. So I need to lower that tire pressure down to 65 to 75 pounds to soften it up enough so any, any irregular potholes or whatever in the road, I don't make my machine bounce. So that is part of calibration. So poll question number four. Running your conveyors at full speeds delivers more rock to the front of the hopper. Yes or no? True or false? Okay, most everybody caught that, that running the conveyors faster does not always give you more rock. There is a fine line in there. So we want to adjust those conveyors to the, the optimum amount of rock that we can carry on that belt.
So that was chip spreaders. That was pretty simple, right? Um, chip spreaders, always remember one thing with a chip spreader. No matter, let's back up. Remember one thing with a chip seal. Don't cheat yourself on the oil. Chip seals fail for a lot of reasons. Okay, We had some poll questions at the beginning of, of why things may fail. It looked like in the poll questions at the beginning, everybody's doing a chip seal for different reasons, but for all the reasons we should be doing a chip seal, you know, to save some money, um, to make sure that um, our roads are sustainable, to prevent deterioration, um, to give it a moisture barrier, to get skid resistance. All those reasons are a reason to do chip seal. But one of the biggest reasons a chip seal fails is because we don't put enough oil on the road. Okay, normally it's not the rock, it's the oil. Oil is the most expensive part and we cheat on the oil and then our rock doesn't stick. So don't cheat yourself on the oil. But use this as a guideline. So you have your oil on the road, you start chipping, Somebody said you need 20 pounds of rock on the road, and it looks a little heavy. Keep bringing that rock down until you can see what I consider a salt and pepper look. You can see oil around those rocks, okay? Because at the end of the day, a chip seal is only one rock thick. No matter how many rocks we put in that oil, you're not going to stack them up. You can't glue them. It's just rocks on top of rocks, and they're going to end up in the ditch and busted windshields. But that transitions into rolling. If we don't get that salt and pepper look and we get too much rock on there, when we go to roll it, really all we're doing by rolling a chip seal is taking the high points of the rock that's standing up in that oil and rolling the flatter sides or the bigger sides down into the oil so we give it a better chance to stick. We push more of the rock into the oil. We're not compacting anything like asphalt does. All we're doing is reorientating those rocks in the oil so we give them a better chance to stick. So when you go into rolling, um, minimum of two rollers, that, that depends how fast you travel. I've seen jobs that have need three rollers. I've seen jobs that only use one roller. Really use your dump trucks as your rollers. First part, if you can stagger your dump trucks as they're backing into your chip spreader, they're your first initial rollers and will do the best job. Um, rolling should occur within five minutes after spraying the oil or putting the rock on it because we want that oil hot enough so that when we move that rock around, it gets in the oil and it has a chance to stick. So we can't roll it later. Um, rolling it should give us about 70 to 75 percent embedment of that rock, at least above 50 or it won't stay. So if you roll it and then you pick up a rock, you want to see that oil up on the side of that rock about halfway or a little more than halfway so that it gets a good chance to stick. And you don't ever want to overroll. Once we roll it up and roll it back and we've moved those rocks around, we want them to stick now. So we don't want to keep rolling and keep trying to move them. We want to get off of there with that roller and be done. So pneumatic tire rollers is what we use. We don't want to use um, steel drummed rollers. All you're going to do is crush the chips. Um, you're going to um, bridge any void that's in the road because chip seal is not going to change the profile of the road. So if you have a dip in it, your steel drummed roller will then bridge that and you won't roll the rock that's in the valley. So we use pneumatic tire rollers. Um, normally, typically 60 pounds on most size roller. Tire pressure is very important on a roller. If your tire pressure gets too low, you'll end up pushing rock on the edges. It, it will start to make grooves on you. If you get your tire pressure too high, your roller tends to want to bounce, and then you're not doing the chip seal any good and you're not rolling. Roll at moderate speeds. Don't roll too fast. Um, it's not a NASCAR race out there. So you just want to roll up and keep up with your, your chip spreader train, roll back, catch back up again. And again, don't overroll. Roll that stuff up to the train, roll it back, catch back up and go. So then what about brooming? Most people will broom their chip seal just to get rid of any of the loose rocks, but if you do a chip seal correctly and your equipment's calibrated right and everything's working good, you should have very little brooming to be done at the end. There should not be very many rocks that do not stick. So, and remember, it's a light brooming. It's a very simple light, get rid of some rocks that didn't stick and we're done. Don't put a lot of down pressure on it. Um, probably should roll um, at least the next morning on emulsions. You don't want to make, um, your oil has to set all night to get stiff and hard. 
So you want to make sure you don't roll or broom it too soon and you start pulling rock up out of your oil. Um, pickup brooms can be used. Um, And I guess that's about all for rolling and water and dust control. So really what you're, you're after there is um, the white brooming, do everything right. You shouldn't have to use much water um, because you shouldn't be using really dusty chips on a chip seal anyhow. So then just in summary, um, you know, what we talked about today is, is check the calibration of your distributors and chip spreaders. That's very important to get in a good job. At the cost of materials today and at the lower budgets that we have, all of that stuff um, means a lot to us. So we want our equipment to be calibrated so that we're getting the job that we want. Know how to handle the materials that you're using. You know, make sure that your rock and your chip spreaders aren't too dusty. They're not too wet either. Um, you know, they're dry. They're one size. Make sure you know what materials you got. Then when it comes to the asphalt or the binder side, you know, make sure you know how to handle your emulsions and how hot to heat them. If you're using hot products, make sure that um, you're wearing all the proper safety gear, all that type of stuff. But you really need to know something about the materials. Make sure that your nozzles are correct for the speed of application you want to go with your distributor truck. Make sure your strainers are clean. Um, check those on your distributor truck. Adjust your chip spreader gates annually. Set your augers and conveyors to consistent speeds so we're not overrunning those. Um, maintain a consistent air pressure on your, your tires of your rollers. Always broom right, lightly. And I always like to throw in there, always work at a team. When you're doing a chip seal, you want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. It goes pretty fast, but we want to do the best job we can so we can keep promoting chip seal as a preventative maintenance program. So I always say success is teamwork. Um, it's the difference between success and failure. If you don't have a team that works well together, and have people that want to do this on your jobs, we probably aren't going to very, get a very good product at the very end. So make sure you work as a team. So here's some helpful links. Um, there's some Federal Highway Administration stuff, the International Slurry Seal Association website, Pavement Preservation and Recycling Alliance website. AASHTO is a good place to go. Etnire.com has a bunch of um, information on it. You can go to our resource center there. Like I said, there's lots of videos on how to calibrate your chipper, how to calibrate your distributor, how to set your radar, that type of stuff, how to operate things. There's stuff that talks about oils and, and stuff on our website. So those are just some helpful links that you can go to. Any questions or anything um, that we have? Um, We'll, we'll skip to the next. If you got any questions, be thinking of them here for a second. And then, Anne, do you want to talk about this? Absolutely. Um, first, thank you, Brian, for today's presentation. I know we all really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today and, and share this with us. Our next webinar in the series will be held on July 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern and will focus on emerging asphalt emulsion technologies. To register, you can follow the link on your screen or visit roadresource.org for more information. With that, I will go ahead and pass it back over to you, Brian and Jason, for the question and answer. All right, thank you. So here's my information. Um, uh, I'm a salesman, remember that. Um, but um, we have a lot of smart people here between engineers and our service um, people. And our sales guys are, are normally very versed on how to do proper chip seal and maintain and calibrate equipment. But you can get a hold of me at, at either of those numbers up here. Um, you can get a hold of me um, by email. Um, I can direct you to other people. Um, you always, if you have any questions about calibrating a distributor or calibrating a chip spreader, our service guys here at the factory are very helpful with that. You can call in and just ask for the service department. Tell them, hey, this is what I'm doing. I got a couple questions about this. Feel free to use us as, as best that you can. Because like I said, we want to make sure that everybody does the best job of chip seal that they possibly can. And that starts with um, making sure the equipment is ready to go. Okay, Brian, I got a few questions. Uh, but before okay. I go to that, I I ask everybody to please take the time to do the evaluations. Um, the evaluations are fairly simple. 
Um, also, uh, file share there, you'll see the downloads for today's uh, uh, webinar. You can download it, it's a PDF file. And then in addition, it has our webinars that we did last year, as well as the ones that are coming up this year uh, for further information. So please take the time to go through that. Okay, Brian, we had a couple questions of above. Uh, one by Tony Barlow, what makes the chipper spread light in the middle? Okay, um, so I'm assuming that's a variable hopper chip spreader or a fixed hopper. Um, so one would be the actual gate setting itself. Um, if we didn't go back down to a 16th inch from the spread row and it doesn't happen to be opening as far as the other gates are, so if your, your gate setting that I explained is off, um, if it's a variable hopper chip spreader, there are cutoff plates in each hopper. And those can be slid in and out. You can actually leave a gap of oil, or if they're slid in too far, you can leave a ridge of oil there. So there's two big plates that slide in and out of that hopper. They're like eight inch plates on the side. If those aren't adjusted correctly, you, you can get light or heavy in the middle. Brian had another question from Brian Smith. Is there a minimum distance to spray when evaluating the calibration of a distributor? Um, no, not actually. Um, we would we would calibrate our radar at 300 feet. So I, I wouldn't spray less than 300 feet. Um, that seems to be about the minimum. But um, the thing about checking, if you're checking the calibration like with the stick or weight or anything that I explained, um, you really want to make sure that you don't change your width. Um, you know, distributors can turn off and on spray bar all the time, so I'd want to pick out a section of road and make sure that if I'm spraying 12 feet, somebody doesn't turn on a foot or turn off a foot because that'll mess it up. But there's no real minimum, but I, I would try to keep it at 300 foot or more. And then along with that, Brian asked, when using the pad measurements, does starting stopping have an effect of getting a uniform application rate? Yes, yes, that does. So you noticed in that picture, if you caught that, we were probably six or eight feet in the oil where we put our pads. Because a distributor is a, a unique machine in the fact that we're circulating oil in that spray bar, and we're getting everything all warmed up. But the second we hit that spray switch, the computer takes over and says, how fast am I going? How wide am I shooting? What is my application rate, and what do I got to do to the pump to get me what you want? So it has to think for a second. So radars don't pick up until about 40 or 50 feet a minute anyhow. So I really want to make sure that I'm rolling, turn my spray bar on, because I don't want to puddle at the beginning, and that's a different topic. We can, we can make sure you don't get a puddle or get light. But I really want to spray a little bit. Um, to make sure my radar is telling my computer the right speed before I come across those pads. So um, six or eight feet is probably far enough um, to double check that. Another question, uh, does the spray bar height not change as a distributor empty when making a shot? It may change slightly. Um, a lot of trucks these days we're putting on air ride suspensions. Um, so it'll change a little bit there. The old spring suspensions, um, I'll be honest with you, um, dating myself again, but back in the old days, we actually tied a cable from the spring suspension of the truck to the spray bar. So if the height of the truck chassis changed, it actually pulled this cable to change the height of the spray bar. We found over the years that the variance of an inch, half an inch, whatever that your truck may vary from loaded to full or loaded to empty, that doesn't really affect anything. Um, so no, most of the time if your truck is running at a a pretty consistent level because you got spring or air ride suspension, your bar is not going to change very much. Not enough to affect your application. 
Thanks, Brian. And there was a question about um, the conversation on rubberized chip seals. Will there be a possible presentation in the near future? And and that's something uh, we have something planned for September. Tim Harwood from Vance Brothers is going to talk about some construction best practices, but we'll see. Maybe we can get something incorporated on rubber chip seals, and if not, we'll get something in the near future. Uh, well, for you, call. Yeah, I, I will tell you that probably in the last five years, there's probably been more changes to the products that we use for chip seal than any time in my career. I mean, we're, we're polymerizing emulsions, we're using rubberized asphalt, we're using um, asphalt, you know, cement with polymer in it, hot oils. There's a lot more hot products coming back than there used to be. Um, they're just constantly changing stuff to try to get better performance out of a chip seal and, and make that rock stick where, where you want it to. So um, when you do presentations like that, I mean, rubberized chip seals is a different animal. Um, so sometimes you got to add some extra things to a distributor to make that style product that's possibly 400 degrees flow through a distributor in that. So um, there's some there's some challenges in a distributor world when you start getting to those really hot, sticky products. As well as I like to include also using wrap as a possible candidate for chip seals. That's another um, uh, product that's coming out there. Arizona as well as New Mexico and California are leading the edges on that, so stay tuned. Yeah, wrap, wrap would be good. Uh, I mean, I've used steel boiler slag. I've used coal boiler slag, um, you know, granite, trap rock, um, limestone, river run gravel. Lots of, you're, you're sort of um, confined in a chip seal to use what's in your area unless you're going to do a lot of trucking. But, but yeah, using um, wrap is, is something that is coming around. Um, and then you fog seal back over the top of it. Nobody ever knows that you didn't pave the road when you're done. Well said. I had another, had another question. Don mm -hmm. Jackson, on a double on a double chip seal, what's the embedment of the emulsion on the first application of the rock? Um, first off, on a double chip seal, the best way to get a true double chip seal is to use two different size aggregates, a bigger aggregate on the bottom and a smaller aggregate on the top. Now, we do do a lot of 3 8 on 3 8 um, which does work, but really a, a true good double chip seal should have a big rock on the bottom and a smaller rock on top. And, and, and still the embedment is the same. Um, you want, you know, 50 to 75 percent embedment. And then on your second coat, you're actually bumping the oil rate up a little bit on your second coat because you're having to fill those voids in those bigger rocks to be able to get the smaller rocks in there and stick to them. So some people think more oil on the bottom, less oil on the top, and actually you're not. But the other concern of a double chip seal is people tend to put the rock on too heavy on the bottom, and it doesn't allow for any of those voids for the smaller rocks to get into. So two big concerns there are, are, are um, deals to think about. Use enough oil to get 50 to 75 percent embedment on the bottom. Use a minimal amount of rock on the bottom and then shoot probably a higher rate on the top level. Brian, we got a few more minutes left, uh, maybe less than that. Um, we'll take a couple more questions, but then we'll have to wrap up for today. Uh, a gentleman had a question, do we use rollers for wrap chip seals? Oh, I would. Um, but I would still use a pneumatic tire because you're still not compacting anything. Um, yeah, maybe your wrap, if your wrap is sticky enough to compact, it's probably not going to go through a chip spreader very well. So that means there's a lot of oil in it and it's balling up on you already. So I would still roll wrap to try to push and move those pieces of wrap around to make sure they get into the oil enough to um, be able to hold it. 
The other thing that wasn't in this presentation that any chip seal, in my opinion, if you go back over and fog seal it, um, you'll get a better product. One, you kill the dust, so people like that. The other is you put that thin layer of, of oil. It's very inexpensive to do fog seals. Um, it's very quick, and you get to lock those rocks into place by, by putting that fog seal on top of it. One last question here for Mike. Uh, how does one get the, oh, it's just on PDHs, um, just send me, send me your information that you're, you're requesting a PDH and I pass it along to Ann and that information will get sent along to you. Um, for those people that had questions about RAP and use of chip seals, I recommend uh, there's a webinar if you go to PPRA's website on April 15th, there was the use of RAP in pavement preservation treatments. I recommend you take a look at that, and there's a there's an actual report that was uh, that was made in December 2020 using reclaimed asphalt pavements and pavement preservation treatments. I recommend you take that as a good reading for your information. With that said, I want to say thank you very much, Brian, for your time, and I'd like to turn it over to you for any final comments. Well, no, thank you for having me. Um, it's always good to promote the cause, I call it, um, to do good preventative maintenance out there and keep our roads in check and, and do them as um, effortlessly and as inexpensive as we can. So please, if there's anything that we can do to help you guys do better chip seal, um, please reach out to us and and we'll do what we can to uh, make sure we're doing the best job that we can for the pavement preservation industry. But thanks again for having me. With that, everybody have a great day, and we'll see you next month. All right. Thank you. That concludes our conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T teleconference service. You may now disconnect.